Um, well, hi everyone, and uh, uh, thanks for having me. Um, what I want to so first of all, my name is Kano Fisher. I uh, work at Julia Computing. I work on Julia, and I work on Ju and the Julia compiler. And what I'm going to be talking about with you today is uh, some of the work I've been doing on automatic differentiation and the abstractions that we have for automatic differentiation in Julia and um, the Julia compiler. So let me, why, okay, there we go. Uh, all right, so first things first, uh, I wanna tell you what this talk is not. So this talk is not about applications of automatic differentiation. So if you wanna learn more about how to use automatic differentiation, in um, machine learning or anywhere else in scientific computing. Uh, there's a separate talk on Friday by my colleague Matt Bauman uh, called The Impact of Differentiable Programming. And there he'll go into all the details about the use of AD in machine learning, in scientific computing, and in what we call uh, differentiable programming more generally. Um, what I do wanna tell you about today a little bit is the requirements for an AD system that come out of um, uh, uh, that that come out of these applications. So I roughly split them into uh, uh, into three big categories, and there's a lot of minor requirements, but these these are sort of the big ones. So I want um, I want generality, which means I want to be able to take higher order derivative. And when I say higher order, I generally mean like fourth and maybe fifth order derivative uh, derivatives. So where do those come up in practice? Well, uh, say you're doing scientific machine learning of uh, say some sort of partial differential equation, and you'll get two orders of derivatives from the partial differential equation, and then you'll get one additional order of derivatives from any embedded uh, neural network. And then maybe you wanna regularize uh, with say gradient penalty, and then you can easily get up to fourth, maybe fifth order. Uh, sometimes people want to do higher th higher orders for exotic things, but what I want to point out is that you know a hundredth order is is not particularly useful. But you do want to you know maybe up to tenth order or so people do uh, occasionally ask for in practice. So higher order derivatives, other things like uh, stochastic functions are interesting. So we care about functions that maybe sample some sort of random variable. They don't necessarily have to be deterministic. Um, but most importantly for generality is that the AD system really supports the full language, including things like control flow, including exceptions. And, you know, Julia is a dynamic language. So all the supported forms of dynamism uh, that we have in the language, we want it to have in our AD system also. So just as a small example of this uh, down here, you know, so we can, um, before we do any derivative, we just ask, okay, what's the cosine of 1.0? you know, 0.5 something, uh, then we can ask, okay, what's the first derivative of sine at that same point? So the little, uh, little tick here is syntax, it's, um, uh, or rather, it, it, it's overloadable syntax, so the AD package overloads it uh, for first order derivatives. So this just asks, okay, what is the first derivative of sine? And of course, we expect it to be the same as cosine. But then we want to do significantly more complicated things also. So down here in the next example, what I'm doing is I'm reading a line, I'm parsing it, and then I'm evaluating it, and then I'm uh, you know, again passing in 1.0. And so I, on the next line where it asks me for the input, I set sign, and I again get the same answer. Uh, and the point here is just that the ID system needs to be able to handle the entire language, even if somebody you know, puts in a read line or a parse or an eval. And obviously this is not a real example, but this kind of thing where people do, you know, very dynamic non-static things, we do want to support well um, in our ID system. The next big thing is flexibility. And by flexibility, I mean that there should not be any like built-in set of things you can use. So we want our users to be able to specify fully custom derivative rules at every level. So say if somebody implements a, a linear algebra library. Of course, linear algebra is built in in Julia, but say it wasn't and the user wanted to, um, uh, wanted to implement a linear algebra library, we would want them to be able to specify rules uh, for hooking into the AD system. Uh, so we have a package called chain rules for that, and this is how you specify rules. So this is a, 
an R rule for SVD at some matrix. And you know, there's some rule for uh, computing the um, for computing the uh, the derivative. Right. So I'm not going to talk about this rule too much here, um, but uh, we will discover the structure of it over the course of the talk. So by the end of the talk, hopefully uh, you'll have some idea of, of why uh, this particular rule looks that way. And then the third big thing is um, performance. So we care about the performance of our AD system. It needs to be faster than what the users could do manually. You know, uh, Julia is a language known for performance and our users come to us for performance. Um, so the AD system needs to have the same level of performance. Uh, it needs to be better than what the users could do manually and any code you throw at it, it needs to have the same high performance. So whether that's scalar code um, or uh, whether that's vector code. Um, all right, uh, so these are the requirements and I'd like to tell you how um, I'm trying to address these requirements in a new AD system. So Julie actually already has a ton of AD systems. There's about 20 or so packages that provide AD functionality in Julia. Um, of those 20, maybe four or five actually used in production um, by people in various domains. So you know, people in machine learning tend to use one, people in optimization tend to use another. Um, and then if you're doing more fancy things, maybe you have a custom one, but they all pick different trade-offs in this feature space that I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, so this talk is based on a, a I guess, pre-preprint I have of my new system called uh, diffractor.jl, and there's a link down here. I'll make the slides available later. Uh, you can go read it. Um, but basically, diffractor tries to find a sweet spot in this, um, uh, in this trade-off space. And I basically want to tell you about three things that come together to make the system possible. And the first two, are really about terminology and abstraction. Because at least in my opinion, if you're trying to um, write a compiler transform, you better really understand your domain and you under better understand what the primitives of your domain are and you better understand what uh, the correct abstractions for your domain are. Because if you do that, you know, writing a compiler transform is difficult enough, but if you have the right abstractions, then you know exactly at least what the compiler needs to do and you have language for talking about, okay, the compiler needs to transform this thing into that thing. And you very, very precisely know what the actual algorithm is that your compiler needs to implement because take derivatives is not really a specification of how to do it. It's, it's what you're expecting the compiler to do, but, uh, but not how to do it. So the first two thirds of the talk will be a lot about motivating abstractions um, that will then let us implement uh, automatic differentiation in our compiler. Uh, so let's get started. And the first thing I want to talk to you about is, uh, is terminology, and in particular, the terminology of the mathematics that we're trying to implement. And in my opinion, at least, the uh, correct terminology for talking about concepts in automatic differentiation is the language of uh, differential geometry. And I've been pushing really uh, in the Julia community at least to uh, really formulate our um, discussions around AD in terms of differential geometry and we're not the only community that's doing so. Um, I should point out the, um, the Swift for TensorFlow community who are also uh, really trying to be precise in the terminology. Um, but differential geometry really provides this framework. So what I wanna do for the first maybe 10 or 15 minutes is uh, to introduce to you some of the basic notions of differential geometry, and then we can explore how those, um, how those notions give rise to the abstractions that I want to build my compiler out of. So let's start very simple. So this is the graph of some function f. Um, you know, some input x down here, some output y, and uh, this just, this just um, graphs the function. Uh, so, so far, so simple. Now we might say, okay, we have some function B, you know, maybe B is five and for our function B, um, we have some output F of B and a corresponding point on this graph. Now, if, um, uh, if this function is what we call smooth, 
then uh, at least very locally around this point B, this function will just be a straight line. So we can just basically draw a straight line right here that matches the slope of this graph at this point. So I've done this here in, um, uh, I've done this here uh, in, in the plotting software and this, this line we call the tangent space um, uh, at B uh, of, uh, in this case, uh, the graph of F. Uh, and we write this just T at B um, graph of F. Uh, now something we can do is we can identify points in this tangent space. So we might say, okay, this point here, this point here, this point here. And the way we usually draw that is as an arrow from the base point to this point on our tangent space. But these are really just like, you know, in this case, our tangent space is one dimensional. So you can just think of that as, uh, as, as one number if you want to. But in, in particular, the important point to remember is that a tangent space is at some particular point. Um, now, if we want to talk about sort of tangent spaces in general, so the tangent space at every point, um, so here, you know, we don't have just have a, fun, a point B, we might have a point C and D and E and so on. Um, we can also talk about that. And if we talk about the disjoint union of all of our tangent spaces, uh, that's called the uh, tangent bundle. Um, and we just write that as T, uh, no subscript uh, in our, and in this case, the, uh, the tangent bundle at the graph of F. So each of these arrows down here that I drew on this graph is some element of the tangent bundle of the graph of F. And something else we can do uh, is we can uh, take what is called a section of the tangent bundle. What a section means is that for every point on this graph F, so you know, not just the couple I drew here, but literally every point, we just assign it some vector. Um, and that is called a section of the tangent bundle. I'm, oops, I'm gonna call that uh, sigma. Um, and this section of the tangent bundle is also called a vector field. So if you are familiar with, uh, uh, with vector calculus, or if you'll remember from your undergraduate differential geometry course, uh, you're probably familiar with this notion of vector fields where we give every point on some curve uh, a corresponding vector. Okay, so I've talked a lot about uh, the tangent space of the graph of F, but in the automatic differentiation context, what we really care about is the tangent space of uh, the input and the output. So if we say a function F goes from some input space X to some input space Y, then what we care about is the, uh, tangent, um, the tangent spaces of X or you know, the tangent bundle of X uh, and the tangent bundle of our output space Y. So here, down here, uh, along the x-axis, I've drawn a bunch of vectors in this, um, in this tangent bundle. And this is a little hard to draw at this point because it's four-dimensional. But basically, you know, each, of these, um, uh, each of these is a, uh, a tangent vector at some, at some uh, point. So this is you know, the tangent space at 5 of x would be this vector. And um, these vectors all have the same length. And in particular, they, ha they have the same length. So uh, that vector field where at every point we just give it the vector of length one has a special name. Uh, we call that partial partial x. And at this point, you know, that's just a name. But of course, it's supposed to be evocative of, of partial derivative. And just one more piece of terminology, uh, you know, if we have this partial part, if we have a particular one, say this one, uh, we would call that uh, partial partial x. Uh, at five. Now something we can do, oops, sorry about that. I, uh, <laughs> the Zoom tools are in the way of my color changing. Uh, something we can do, uh, I hope my screen is back. I think so, yeah. Uh, so something we can do is for a particular vector, say this one, we can track through, we can ask, okay, what is the slope on this graph? And then we can over go over here and we get a a corresponding tangent vector in our target space. So basically the length of this vector in the, um, uh, in the target space 
is the slope of the graph at f. And basically, you can think of it uh, as asking, OK, if at, um, at this particular point I go you know, one uh, upwards on the tangent space, how much will I go you know, sideways or up in the, uh, uh, in the target space? So this function is called uh, the push forward. Um, and we write that f lower star, and it goes from the tangent bundle of x to the tangent bundle of y. So you know, each of these dashed lines is basically one evaluation of this function f lower star, the, um, uh, the push forward. OK, and we can, uh, we can plot this push forward another way. So this, this plots the push forward. Um, and this, again, is just another way to plot our, um, our vector field partial partial x. You know, it's just one at every point. You know, it's a function from x to a tangent space. And we can apply the, the push forward and get some graph in the you know, y, ty plane. And the details aren't so important. But one of, what I want to point out is that even if f is not self-intersection, uh, is not self-intersecting, we can get degeneracies uh, in the push forward. So you know, there's some point here where both f, uh, y and ty are the same for two different points um, uh, after the push forward. And this is going to cause us some problems later. So I just wanted to uh, highlight it here in the simple case, um, such that it makes sense later uh, when we get to it. OK, so let's switch to the two-dimensional case, because it's a little more interesting. Uh, we're going to talk about Gaussians. So this is just a 3D plot. Um, and again, this is the graph of a function. And the function is, uh, is a Gaussian. So oops, uh, it's e to the minus x squared plus y squared, just a simple Gaussian. Um, and here, we're plotting the graph in 3D. It's a little hard to um, draw on this for me. So what I'm going to uh, do instead is I'm going to show you the, the top-down view of this graph. And uh, the color coding, you know, brighter, brighter colors indicate higher numbers. But it's basically just the same thing we saw before, uh, but with a, with a top-down view. Uh, so now we can also, again, talk about these vector fields that we have. So we have two uh, interesting vector field bases now, because it's a two-dimensional input. So we would call this vector field partial partial x, because it you know, points in the x direction. And then we call this vector field um, partial partial y, because it points in the, in the y direction. But it's just the same sort of basic vector field notion that we talked about before, where it just assigns the vector you know, of value 1 pointing in the corresponding direction at every point in our input. OK, so the next thing to talk about is the, uh, is the notion of a gradient. So gradients are at some point. So we can say the gradient at point B of f. So if we have some point B, maybe right here, then the gradient, which is this vector that I'm plotting, points into the direction of, um, of greatest change. And gradients are interesting for applications. If you're doing some sort of optimization, if you're doing machine learning, you'd like to make some function bigger or smaller. So the gradient is something you might care about in that context. OK, so how do we compute these gradients? I, com I uh, claim uh, we compute them as follows. So I claim we get, our, um, uh, we get our basis vector field at that point. So this is partial partial x at b. Um, uh, so that's uh, partial partial y at b, of course. Uh, and this is partial partial x at b um, at b. And I claim we push these forward using our f lower star. And then we get you know, some, some push forward f lower star uh, partial partial y at b and, and same for x. And, and this sort of makes sense, right? This vector is pointing down because in this direction, a function gets smaller. So it basically says, OK, in that direction, things get smaller. In the other direction, things get larger. Uh, so I claim that our definition of the gradient is basically the following. Uh, we take the length of a vector, say, partial partial x. So we ask, OK, how long is this? Uh, that's, that's this part down here. Um, uh, how long is this vector after we push it forward? And we take that in the x direction. And then we do the same thing in the y direction. So if we were to do that, Graphically, 
um, on the plot, you know, this one's negative, so it kind of points in that direction. The other one's positive, so it kind of points up. And if we add them together, you know, we get a vector that kind of points in, in that direction. And it looks right, but this definition kind of bothers me. And it bothers me for the following reason. I mean, we're combining something from the right-hand side. You know, we're combining the length of this vector here. And then we're sort of scaling vectors in the original space. So it's kind of combining something from left and right. And, you know, they just intuitively don't really feel like they should go together. So um, I want to prove to you that this is indeed the vector that points into the direction of greatest change. And I want to make an important observation of why we are combining, you know, things from the left and things of, uh, from the right-hand side of this function in order to compute this. Uh, so if we have, uh, the way I'm going to show this to you is uh, take an arbitrary tangent vector eta. Uh, so this I'm going to call eta. And then I'm going to rescale eta by the length of my push forward um, of eta. And the push forward of eta is just, uh, as we've talked about a couple of times now, uh, basically the amount of change of f in the direction of eta. Uh, so if we do that for all of our tangent vectors here on the left-hand side, uh, we get the plot of rescale tangent vectors here on the right-hand side. And down here is the, um, uh, is the equation that actually corresponds to that. And I claim that we can compute uh, eta by linearity by just looking at um, by looking at eta in our two directions, and if we do that, we get an expression that looks like this. So it's it's uh, eta in the x direction times what we previously saw as the factor in our in our gradient, and then eta in the right direction times you know the gradient component in the y direction. So if we do it this way, our gradient kind of looks like a, this looks like a dot product, and it looks like a dot product between our gradient at b and our tangent vector eta. And um, uh, you know, if, if you're familiar with dot products, dot products are largest when the two vectors point in the same direction. So indeed, the largest vector eta that we could possibly have is the one that points in the same direction as what I previously called the gradient. So indeed, you know, the gradient is the largest um, tangent vector according, according to this rescaling. Um, and this points to something significantly more fundamental. So uh, this dot product really assigns to every tangent vector eta uh, some number, and that number being uh, the rate of change of f in this direction. So uh, something that, uh, that assigns a number to every vector we call a covector, and in this particular case, a cotangent vector. So uh, we might write this by saying, okay, the length of a push forward of eta is just the evaluation of a cotangent vector dz. So dz is just the uh, unal cotangent vector in the z direction. It measures how long are things along the z axis. So remember, that's what we did. And we just ask, okay, how long is this push forward of, uh, of eta along f in the z direction? Um, but we might also say this differently. We might ask, okay, what if instead of pushing forward a cotangent vector eta, we pull back, so we sort of took the inverse image of dz under our function f, um, and we asked, okay, what's the pullback? Uh, so we call this the pullback f of a star of dz, and then we just evaluate this, um, we just evaluate this at eta. And you can also think of this as, uh, think of this left-hand side as sort of the definition of the right-hand side. So right now we've just moved some terms around, um, but the real difference between um, uh, between cotangent vectors and tangent vectors comes up when we look at composition. So when we look at uh, how do we compute uh, this function, in this case our gradient, as the composition of simpler functions. Uh, so here's some uh, Julia code that co that computes uh, this Gaussian, and you know there's 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 five steps in it, and I'm just going to call these you know f1 uh, through f5, and you know th these are simpler than our original uh, e to the minus x squared plus y squared, um, but they compute the same thing, right? So this is just a recipe for computing this Gaussian. 
Okay, so if we look at that here on the left hand side, you know, I just wrote down f1 through f5. Um, uh, if, we, if we look at what we just did to compute the gradient, well, uh, you know, first of all, we computed the original function, so we just computed f1 and f2 and so on, you know, f3, uh, f4, and f5 through all of these primitives. And eventually we ended up with this point over here, which is, you know, our original f of x, y, um, the Gaussian that just gives us some value um, in, this, uh, in this z space, the color space. But then uh, to push forward the, um, the tangent vectors, we have the same structure, but except instead of the original function, we now have these push forwards. So we have f1 lower star, f2 lower star, you know, f3 lower star, and eventually, you know, we get, uh, we get our two vectors uh, originally from the x direction and originally from the y direction uh, that we saw on, this pre on the previous slide. Um, okay, so this is what we call a functor, um, or it should remind you of a functor. So if we have some function from x to y, um, you know, we get some function f lower star from uh, tx to ty, you know, with some function f in the middle and you know, f lower star. So this is f lower star. And, um, you know, uh, for every x we have a tx, for every f we have an f lower star. And this thing that I just showed you um, uh, basically showed that composition in uh, that composition down here, uh, composition, uh, is the same thing as composition up here. And that's, that's what it means to be a functor. Uh, okay, but th this does not work for uh, cotangent vectors. So if we were looking at, you know, cotangent vectors, uh, we can't just say, okay, we have a cotangent bundle y and a cotangent bundle x and you know we draw the thing the other way um, but we don't get a covariant factor um, in the same way that we do for push forwards and the reason for that is basically as follows so let's let's draw the same uh, let's draw, draw the same diagram so you know we start with dz and then we get um, some other cotangent vector so we go we go backwards you know we go okay here what's the slope here, and then we go down here, you know, the, the usual thing, um, except backwards this time, and then we get some, you know, cotangent vector d delta, and then we might get some cotangent vector uh, d gamma, but here we ran, at a, uh, we ran into a problem because this function plus is not one-to-one, -one. and this is analogous to this degeneracy that I showed you uh, a couple of slides ago. And in particular, we need to know, in order to compute this, we need to know this height. And this height is just alpha, and this height is just beta. Um, so uh, we need to know this height, but we don't have it here, because here we're going backwards. So I guess I should have said that. So we're going backwards, uh, because we're going backwards from our um, destination. So this is f5, f4, f3, and, and so on. So we're going backwards, but we don't have these values alpha and beta. So what we need to do is we need to remember them Basically, from the previous slide, we need to remember what alpha is, we need to remember what beta is, um, and then this goes through. But, you know, this remembering is significantly more complicated than, um, uh, than what we did for the tangent vectors, because we have, we have all this additional state. And in, this is also what messes up um, this functoriality of the cotangent bundle, because we don't know what the base point is. Um, without remembering it from some forward evaluation of the function. Okay, so uh, here's the same thing, just drawn in sort of uh, data flow graph form. So we have a functions x and y, they come in, we square them, you know, these were what we called f1, f2, um, f3, and so on, and eventually we get down here to our, um, uh, 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 to our cotangent vector, um, and I, I should say, a, a a section of the cotangent bundle is also called a differential one form. So I might interchangeably use, uh, you know, covector field or differential one, uh, differential one form. They, they kind of mean the same thing. But this is just, you know, the thing that evaluates things in the z direction. 
Um, so we go here and then, you know, we had our, uh, what's D gamma or D, D eta or whatever. Uh, yeah, D gamma. Uh, and then we had our D alpha and our, this should have been D beta. Um, D beta and our D alpha. So it's just the same thing as the previous slide, except written in a slightly different form. And the important thing to remember is that we are remembering these points uh, X and Y. And actually we also need to remember gamma. Um, okay, but this should look very familiar to people who browse uh, category theory archive. Now, I'm not one of those people, but some people in the Julia community do browse category theory archive. And we have this big discussion on, okay, what is actually the structure? Because the structure of uh, you know, compositions of uh, pullbacks of cotangent vectors looks kind of odd. And I was pointed to this excellent paper, Categories of Optics um, by Mitchell Riley. And if you look at that, he says, okay, two optics compose in this way. So you have two optics, one here, one here. And you basically compose them by um, plugging this optic into the hole of the other one. And if you squint a little bit and go back to our previous slide, that's exactly what we have here. So our composition basically consists of all of these uh, nested, you know, the stack of what, um, uh, what Mitchell Riley calls, calls optics. Um, uh, so what's an optic? Optic is, uh, you know, some sort of algebraic category theory construction, um, you know, written out this way, but I really like the diagrams. And in, in the diagram, you basically see, okay, we have some function L, we have some function R, you know, we have some gap in the middle from A to A, A prime where you can just plug in a regular function. And we basically say two optics are the same. Um, if, uh, uh, so we basically identify two optics if you can shift around some function F across this dividing line. So, you know, it doesn't matter what this residual M here actually is. So this is what we call M the residual. As long as what goes into R is the same, uh, we consider those the same optic. Um, so uh, that's the definition of an optic. And now I wanna make a very precise statement and an observation that basically summarizes everything I've just talked about. And the observation is the following. We have some functor, um, I'm writing this partial with an, uh, with an arrow on top. And uh, this functor, basically, if you, um, and, and the, the functor goes from some underlying C, category C to optic C. Um, and if you do it on Riemannian manifolds to the category optic of Riemannian manifold, what you get are these pullbacks of differential one forms. So optic is really the, in some sense, the natural thing that represents pullbacks of differential one forms. And my claim is basically the exact same functor if you apply it, if you apply it to Julia code, and to be precise, I sort of mean SSA form code, um, then you get what is traditionally known as reverse mode AD. Um, so we sort of knew that uh, reverse mode AD corresponded to uh, pullbacks of cotangent vectors, but this optical construction makes it very, very precise um, what this analogy actually is. So there's some underlying category theory construction that gives us either pullbacks or reverse mode AD, depending on what underlying category you plug in. Uh, so we knew this, as I said, um, and just to illustrate it a little bit, these are slides, just three slides from a talk I gave at uh, at CGO last year. Um, so our previous generation AD tool, which was sort of the most sophisticated and compiler-based one, is called Zygote. And at CGO, I basically said, okay, AD is really just a compiler problem. So what you do is, you know, you, uh, uh, you have some forward pass and some backward pass, and the backward pass kind of goes backwards. And then, you know, for every statement in your forward pass, you get a statement, um, uh, for every statement in your original thing, you get a statement in the forward pass and a statement in the backward pass, and you know it goes forward and then it goes it goes backwards um, if you look at the direction of the original function. Um, and then I said, hey, look at this fancy thing. We can do closure conversion, and we get some structure that captures a bunch of things. So you know now that we have this language of optics, 
we can actually identify, okay, this structure is just the residual of the uptake and we have our two functions L and R. Okay, so, so far I've done a whole bunch of abstract nonsense, but it just hasn't actually told me anything I didn't know yet, right? And, you know, I really, I really like abstraction, but if I'm gonna put all, in all this effort to come up with abstractions, it better tell me something I didn't know yet. Um, and, and this is really the cool thing. So this is, you know, if you've been falling asleep until now, uh, wake up right now, because this is, this, is, this is what I've been building towards basically for the past, you know, 25 minutes, 30 minutes. Uh, so there's something called a higher order optic and Riley defines this, but he doesn't quite define it this way. So a big warning, I made up this terminology, but uh, I find it really helpful. So uh, there's something called a higher order optic, in this case, a three optic. And it basically looks just, just like one, two, three uh, optics chained back to back. And this is, this is the definition of it. And you know, three optics have three holes and they have some composition rule that I'm gonna show you in a little bit. Uh, so that's one way to define three optics. However, there's also something else we can do. So optics can be defined over any symmetric monoidal category, but an optic over some symmetric monoidal category is itself again, a, uh, a symmetric monoidal category. So optic C is a symmetric monoidal category. So we can form optic optic C and get what I call a one one optic. Um, and this is from my write up. This is basically how we, how we draw this one one optic. And one one optics compose in this way. So you, know, you take the whole of the first, you go to the input of the second, you have a hole here and then you go back and then you, know, you have a second hole, blah, blah, blah. And you, know, you basically see, okay, this gives you another one one optic with these three, um, with this three, uh, these three holes in it. So uh, that's the composition rule for, uh, for, for one one optics. And now the really key result that I'm getting from introducing this abstraction is that uh, this three optic is the same thing as this one one optic, uh, as this one one optic down here. And if you're saying to me, well, uh, duh, this is obvious, you know, you just take this arrow, bend it down, and then you take uh, this other arrow and sort of bend it up. And, you know, then it kind of looks like the same thing. Maybe you have to add an additional arrow here, and then you merge these arrows. Um, you know, then I've done my job, because it is kind of simple to see this in the, um, in the language of optics. But if you project it back down to, um, to code, it actually gets uh, it actually gets quite complicated. Uh, so that brings me to talk about compilers and I'm kind of running short on time. So I will do this pretty quickly. So uh, a first quick interlude, why is Julia fast in general? So how does Julia work and how does it get performance? So a uh, big topic and I'm gonna do it in about two minutes. So uh, let's say we come in and we have some value uh, say of type int. So then we come in to some function, let's call it f. And what Julia at this point does is it does a static analysis that basically asks, okay, what are all the reachable functions from F? So maybe there's some function G and some function H and it'll know, okay, maybe here we do int and here we do float. So this, this it does statically um, on just the code via type inference. And then maybe this is also a float, um, but then maybe when I go out here, no, it doesn't know. So maybe this is just any. So it has no idea what's gonna happen here and maybe the same thing here. Right, so this is, this is a static analysis. Type inference uh, tells you, yeah, type inference basically explores this control graph for you. Uh, so what Julia will then do is it'll take sort of this locally static neighborhood. Um, so I, I call this a locally static neighborhood. Um, and here it, basically looks like a static function. So it knows these are integers, it knows these are floats, it knows what all these functions are. So any static optimization you can think of, it is able to perform in this uh, locally static neighborhood and then it'll go run it and it'll find, okay, maybe the actual path through the execution is here. And then at this point, maybe it'll know, okay, this time at runtime, this was actually just another int again. And then uh, we, start, uh, we start this whole process over. Uh, so that's how Julia gets performance by basically locally looking like a static language. And now in order to, uh, so optics don't really fit into this, 
uh, into this setting because you know we have a bunch whole bunch of things we don't know and then eventually we get back to basically you know the reverse uh, the reverse image of what we have here so this is our optic but we have this big question mark in the middle that we don't know anything about so optics don't really fit into this paradigm uh, so in order to optimize this we are adding a new uh, language feature called an opaque closure opaque closures uh, look like closures but they have some fairly subtle semantic differences. So for one, they are typed by signature rather than identity. Uh, I'm not gonna go into details, both for lack of time and it, because it goes kind of into language design details of Julia that are whole separate talk. But uh, just to make the point, they're typed by signature rather than identity. They do not observe world age changes. So world age is a mechanism um, that allows basically dynamic modifications of uh, method tables. So they don't observe it. So if you capture something and then later redefine something, uh, opaque closures, unlike regular closures, will use the old function, uh, the old version of the function rather than the new version of the function. And perhaps most importantly, access to the closure environment is disallowed outside the call to the closure itself. So on, a, on these sort of red edges that I drew on the previous slide, where we have to have dynamic semantics, um, opaque closures basically don't have one other than you can call it. So that basically lets the optimizer choose, okay, what is this residual for this particular opaque closure, rather than having to have a, um, uh, a capture environment statically or lexically defined. Um, and because of these restrictions, it lends itself really well to um, optimizations. I'm basically out of time, so I'm gonna go through this quickly, but this is, um, this is basically the key thing of how are we representing this in Julia? So we're literally representing this functor, uh, that color choice, we're literally representing this functor, you know, the partial with the arrow over it, we're representing it in Julia, and we're saying, okay, you can call this functor, you can give it some function f, you can give it some arguments, and it will do everything that I just talked to you about. You know, it will compute these two functions, l and r, the left and right functions, and it'll represent them. So, um, this slide, I think, is really, is really the key. I, I really, really like the slide. Um, so this is literally the definition of gradient in the library. And what does it say? Well, to, it says to compute a gradient, you know, take this functor, pass an f, pass in the arguments. You're going to get out, you know, the original primal value. So if you remember our optic, right? We had, uh, we had some primal value down here. So this is just a primal value y. Um, and then, so we get out the primal value, we get out this opaque closure, which corresponds to this error up here, a residual. So this is, this is f upper star. And then it says, okay, well, take y, pass it into d, dx, and this is what we've been calling dz. So the, the cotangent vector in our target domain. Then, you know, pass that back into, uh, back into f of a star, and then, you know, uh, then you get the output, and that's, that's the gradient. So uh, this, is, this is really, really cool, because it shows in code that this analogy that I'm drawing with the gradient between pullbacks of, uh, of cotangent vectors and, um, and uh, gradients, on the other hand, is, you know, not just some mathematical fantasy, but it, it, you actually see it in the code. So I really like this. Maybe it's a little too neat, but um, uh, you know, th this is sort of the, what, what we get for our efforts of just, um, coming up with these abstractions. Um, uh, so one more thing to say, and I'm, uh, we can talk about it more in the discussion since I'm out of time, but uh, this is basically uh, this isomorphism between three optics on the one hand, so the left-hand side here is a three optic, and one one optics, um, one one optics on the on the other hand. And why do we need to implement this isomorphism? Well, this rule definition that I showed you at the beginning is really a one optic. Uh, so we can take, uh, we can come up with uh, higher order uh, derivatives by applying basically our functor uh, to uh, the definition of our R rule, and we get a one one optic. And then if we wanna use that in our high order derivatives as a three optic, um, uh, we basically need to do this transformation. 
Uh, but then we also actually also need the inverse of the um, of the isomorphism because sometimes people might explicitly write, you know, the gradient of the gradient uh, of something. So they're explicitly asking for a one-one optic, and we can write this one-one optic as a two optic by you know having some semi-complicated code that computes this. And I'm not at, I'm, you know I'm not expecting you to understand what this code does, but it implements this isomorphism that look you know, so trivial in this graphical representation of the optic. Um, all right, and here's some extra code, uh, but I'm gonna skip it for lack of time. If somebody asks me about it, I'll go back to it. Um, but this is basically the summary of the three parts that come together to allow us to um, uh, come up with a system that meets all of these requirements and has some very strong fundamentals. So we have our differential geometry, which define the notions of tangent vectors and cotangent vectors. We have our optical constructions that showed us, okay, if I wanna compose functions, what does that imply for compositions of these cotangent vectors? And then we have a new language feature that implements basically language support adapted to these optical constructions that allows us to make it really fast. And in particular, it allows us to make it really fast also at higher orders because this isomorphism between one one optics and three optics uh, basically allows us to represent everything as just a single thing as this like arrow that goes from left to right and and is somewhat opaque all right and that's what i have but i'm certainly happy to talk more about it in the discussion so i think we have about 40 minutes though i ran seven minutes over so maybe 33 minutes for discussion good okay thank you Kina. um um, thanks very much. My name is Simon Peyton Jones. I have the honour of uh, coordinating the discussion on this talk. Um, so uh, you can um, you can type questions into the Zoom chat or just just uh, raise your hand, um, and I'll uh, and I'll uh, give you the floor. Maybe maybe uh, those of you who are asking questions, perhaps you can switch your cameras on if you've got one available, um, so we can wave at you as well. Uh, it's always nicer to answer questions to a face if possible. Um, Good. I don't see any hands yet, so I'm going to I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask a question since there's a since there's a moment. But other people, please um, uh, feel free to jump in. So, um, Kina, one of the things you started by saying is you'd like to um, uh, like to handle you know all the features of the language. So yes. you talked about generality in the form of doing higher order derivatives, but there you mean by the second derivative and the third derivative. Yes. Say anything about higher order functions? That is, you know, lambdas in your language. You know, can you take the uh, the derivative of map and fold? Um, uh, that... Yes, you can. Uh, so um, I don't have a slide for it, so it's it's somewhat hard. Uh, it's somewhat hard that. to explain. But yeah, um, uh, yeah so uh, you know, so basically, um, uh, let me let me see how I can say this. So let's go. Let's and what go we to... So what is the tangent space of x arrow y? Uh, uh, the the tangent right the, what is well so it, it's a, it's an interesting question right because in order to have a tangent space you need to have some sort of variation well, so if you have a function you know yeah. x arrow y uh, that is parameterized so maybe you have some family of functions you know uh, f sub x for some arbitrary real number x uh, then, you know, mapping that function over some values does actually give you a derivative with respect to the function. Uh, so if I, uh, if I just scroll down here, so I, I sort of skipped over this tail call that I had in this definition of the gradient. And the reason for that is that in, in Julia, the, um, um, this functor will actually give you uh, pullbacks with respect to all the arguments, including the function. And if you are thinking about non-parameterized functions like sine, uh, obviously the tangent space is just zero dimensional, so it's completely non-interesting. But if you have some parameterized function, you might actually get an interesting uh, cotangent vector with respect to, uh, with respect to the function. Um, so uh, that's, that's where, where, sorry, yeah. What is a parameterized function? I mean, functions have parameters, they're just well functions. Uh, what is a parameterized function? Yeah, uh, so what I mean by that is, uh, what I mean by that is like a curried function, for example, uh, that... Uh, well, but you uh, could uncurry it, you just regard it as taking a pair. Um, 
So coding yeah. has one new level of complexity, I agree, but we could just think of map, say, which takes a, yeah. let's say, a vector yeah. and a function, let's, and it could just be an ordinary uncoded function. Yeah, so let's, let's do map f, and it takes, you know, some, some collection of values x. So, yeah. uh, so you're asking, what, what are you asking? Well, I don't know. So, so um, you've been speaking about tangent spaces. Yes. So here, the, the input space is a pair of a function from a to b and a vector of a. Yeah. Right. So now well, I need so to it's, ask, what's the tangent it's the, space of that input space. Right. So, so what's the tangent space of that input? Well, it's the tangent space of f cross the tangent space uh, of x. So now the question is, well, what's the tangent space of f? Indeed. And I'm saying if it's just a regular function like sine, that tangent space is zero dimensional. Uh, so it's basically just a point. So for just simple functions, uh, you're just looking at the tangent space of x. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, if, if, if x is some if x is some vector, you know, this tangent space of x uh, will be some product of the tangent space of the first index times the tangent space of the second index times the tangent space uh, at the third index, and so on. Um, but the, and that's actually something. But the function sorry, might, be, might be a lambda. It might be something like that. What you pass the map might be something like lambda x x plus y. Right. 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 So. Right. If so, if you if your if your function is 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 lambda um, uh, uh, lambda x x plus y, and it captures y, then obviously the uh, so if this is your function f, so then obviously your function uh, the tangent space is a tangent space with respect to the um, the closure environment of your lambda. So it'll basically be you know, the tangent space of the value corresponding to y. So whatever, uh, mm -hmm. whatever y is. So it'll be the tangent space of the, of the capture environment. Um, and it, it makes sense if you think about it, if you think about closure conversion, that just turns, you know, a closure into the structure of its, um, uh, of its capture environment because, you know, the, the uh, tangent space of a structure is just the tangent space, uh, the product of the tangent spaces of all the elements of the structure. So if you think about closure conversion, um, you know you basically see immediately that the tangent space of some lambda is the tangent space of all of the things that it captures, the product of the tangent space of all the things it captures. So somehow the, you're saying it kind of all works out with functions. Are you usually high order functions make things seem to make things significantly harder? But you're saying just it doesn't actually cause a problem in practice. Oh, no, it doesn't cause a problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, but I mean, th that it doesn't cause a problem because uh, this language of tangent space is very general, right? Uh -huh. So you can, you can think of tangent spaces that are themselves like deeply nested structures whose structure matches, you know, basically the data structure that you put in. Um, and it gets very complicated if you try to think of it in terms of like, plain partial derivatives, because you always need to choose a basis. Um, so I mentioned at the very beginning, we don't want to choose a basis for a cotangent space. And I had a slide on uh, what we call the cotangent basis problem, which is that um, uh, sometimes you don't know uh, what your cotangent space looks like, or you might have two different representations of, uh, of your cotangent space. So for example, you can represent Present a vector as both like a mathematical quantity, in which case its tangent space is another vector in terms of a mathematical quantity, or you might uh, choose a basis and represent the vector as, you know, a list of components. Um, and those tangent spaces look very different. One is just like um, a product space of all the different components, and the other space is. Uh, again, something that looks like the original mathematical space. And an implementation, basically, what defines the structure of the vector space is uh, the function that indexes from the vector into uh, the, basically the projection function from the vector onto the basis. But that function you might not have available when you're trying to do operations of the cotangent space. So that adds a, adds a whole other level of complexity that I decided to skip for this talk because it gets really complicated and we don't really have an answer uh -huh. for it yet. Yeah. Okay, here's a question from the, the chat. It says, um, are local, are local non-local compiler transformations in the title, do they refer to opaque closures? 
does it mean that Julia will optimize them in some particular way? Would you speak uh, to closures outside of the context of automatic differentiations? What will they give me as a casual Julia program? So I guess this is just a question about the opaque closures as a feature in their own right. Right. Okay. So opaque closures. Um, maybe I'll. Uh, maybe you could give a small example because at the moment I've got yeah, the vaguest yeah. idea of what an opaque closure might be. Yeah. Can you give us a let tiny me, example of a? Let me closure? let me pull up the PR that uh, implements them, which has a tiny example. Um, so, whoops. Um, okay. Uh, these examples might be too tiny. Okay, uh, let's let's maybe do. Uh, let's maybe do this example down there. Okay? Looks syntactically like a regular closure. So if you're can familiar you with Julia code, um, yeah. can you make it larger? Yeah, I apologize. And yeah. remember that not all of us are Julia experts, so I, I'm still doing less cool analysis. I haven't even got as far as parsing. Yeah, I, I, I was afraid that might happen, which is why I decided not to show too much like actual Julia code. Yeah. Just talk about the abstractions because I, oops, that is too large. Sorry about that. My uh, computer doesn't like the streaming and the, okay, is this, is this big enough? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, so this, you know, this is regular. Uh, can I draw on this? This is, what if I, looks like Zoom has a feature. Hey, I can, can people see the arrow I just drew? Yeah. Okay, so this is cool. This is, this is the Zoom feature for annotating. So uh, this is just a regular closure. So, you know, B, um, uh, 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 so this is uh, uh, this just says okay I have uh, I have some function that returns a closure and it asks that b be of type a and then it returns uh, the evaluation of um, uh, of n dim so the number of dimensions of b times some other thing that I put in uh, you know maybe a vector or a matrix b um, so the uh, dynamic semantics of this as a regular closure is that it needs to capture uh, it needs to capture this value a right, right? so just one sec Kino. so the value yeah. that's returned it is a value it's an opaque closure so what you can yes. do with an opaque closure what you can do with an ordinary closure is apply it that's really about all yes when a opaque closure yes. is the same all you can do is apply it I all you can do is apply it, but there's semantic differences to regular closures that are specific to how closures work in Julia. Okay. Uh, so uh, let, let me uh, so let me explain that, and uh, you know, if the explanation doesn't make sense, tell me afterwards, and I'll try again. So um, basically, lexically, the closure environment captures captures the value a. Okay. So a is what ca what's captured by this closure. Now the problem is that A can be pretty big, uh, right? So A might be, you know, a 40 megabyte matrix or something, right? So if we look at this, I don't really need to know A. I kind of need to know, I only need to know N dims of A, um, which is something much smaller. You know, it'll be an integer, it'll maybe be two. So we'd really kind of like a closure that uh, captures not A, but only and dims of A. And ideally, we'd like the compiler to be able to do this for us. Um, so in Julia, the problem is that this is semantically disallowed. And it's semantically disallowed for the following reason, uh, in, in the dynamic context. So if, if the compiler can see everything, so uh, I, I talked about these locally static regions. And uh, part of the idea behind Julia is that these locally static regions are really large. So, you know, they can, Basically, if you're writing high performance code, your locally static region will be basically be your entire program. Um, um, so if, if everything is locally static, then it can do this transformation. But dynamically and semantically, this transformation is disallowed. And the reason this transformation is disallowed is because somebody might 
go in and between the return of this call and the application of the closure, they might redefine what NDIMS means. So, you know, it's a dynamic language. You can dynamically redefine things. So semantically, we must capture A such that in the unlikely event that somebody goes back and redefines NDIMS, we can evaluate the new NDIMS. So opaque closures basically change the rules such that uh, they do not observe changes to the global method table that happen after they get created. So in particular, that means that I'm allowed to capture NDIMS of A rather than just A. Um, and when I evaluate it, it will see the old version of NDIMS um, rather than the new version, even if NDIMS got changed in the middle. Uh, so that's sort of the biggest semantic difference between regular closures and opaque closures. Um, and you know, there's, there's, there's some other subtleties. So for example, uh, the debugger can't really step into opaque closures the same way because uh, opaque closures get optimized at creation point rather than at application point. Um, and by optimized, I just you know, literally mean something like this, where it captures NDIMS rather than uh, A. Um, and, and this optimization can be extremely aggressive, right? So basically, if you have some composition of opaque closures, as you do in the AD context, then it can basically inline everything into just a single opaque closure, uh, which is also something that's disallowed in the, uh, with regular closures. Uh, but if you don't have the same uh, semantics around dynamism that Julia has, uh, your closures might already be opaque. Uh, it's just that in Julia, they aren't because of this potential for redefinition dynamics. Can, can Does a, that kind of make sense? Can A be redefined as well? Uh, no, A can't be redefined because it's local, so it's captured. So uh, NDIMS is a global identifier. So it, uh, uh, it captures NDIMS, but what it captures is the method NDIMS. Uh -huh. And uh, methods are just pointers into the global method table, basically. So it doesn't capture, um, and, and the reason for that is that um, uh, it, Julia is heavily multiple dispatch based. So at application points, uh, methods get resolved to, or uh, uh, functions get resolved to a particular method. Uh, so, you know, and dims of A here, what actually gets called depends on the, on the type of A. So this uh, resolution from functions to methods happens at application time. So, the method table can be modified between, um, uh, 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 yeah, uh, okay. So there's a the question in the chat said I didn't answer, <laughs> I didn't answer what I mean by uh, non-local transformations. And uh, yes, I, I mean opaque closures. And let me go back to, um, uh, let me go back to this. Um, how do I? Oh, I'm still annotating in Zoom, so I can't scroll. Let me stop that. Nope. How do I, how do I stop annotating? Uh, huh. uh, is there some? Oh, I see. Ah, okay, there was a toolbar that was hidden. Uh, so now I can. Okay, let me let me clear my screen annotations. Um, all right, sorry about that. I'm still still learning how Zoom works. Um, right. So what I mean by uh, what I mean by non-local transformations is transformations that, um, okay, so let's, let's go back to, uh, nope, too far. Uh, let's go back to this. So, you know, we had, we had some sequence of functions, you know, F, F1 through F5. And so this is F1, this is just a regular F1. 
but this is some other function that depends on f1, but it's all the way over here. So in the, um, in the push forward context, we could basically go through function statement by statement and just like locally expand, you know, one statement into two statements and um, get, uh, get the correct result. And that means that push forwards can be um, implemented by uh, doing something very local. So you can implement them, for example, as operator overloading in say C++ or Python, um, because it just like locally turns one statement into a statement that computes both X and the push forward of X. But in the, in the pullback case, uh, that doesn't work. So you need to modify both this primal function X and some other you know, reverse function that happens much, much later in the, control in the control graph. And there's sort of a long range dependency of um, uh, type information and other sort of compiler information that you might want. So you, know, you may want to do things like dead code elimination or loop invariant code motion. And you know, they happen at two very different points in the control flow graph. So this kind of thing is, is, is pretty tricky to do um, in a compiler transform, and uh, at, at least naively. So opaque closures are, um, uh, uh, opaque closures are basically a mechanism to, to basically say, okay, I'm turning this one function into two function, but this other function optimize it now, but I'm not gonna call it until later. So it basically allows me to turn these non-local transformations that are naively very far apart into things that they can actually locally optimize. Hmm. Okay, but does it end up as a sort of source to source transformation in the end? Yes, it's a source to source transformation. You're sort of building, building some kind of trace at runtime that you have to then execute. Well, I'm not building a trace, right? Like it's a, it, like it's, it's, well, is that you, you have to sort of capture these values that you use later, as you say, perhaps much later, which is kind of like a trace. So it's, it's like a trace, but in the AD context, there's a well-known technique, which is tracing, which is that you basically dynamically just record every operation that you do. Yeah. And then, you know, you run the, backwards, yeah. run the trace backwards. But the key difference here is that we are building a trace, but it's a trace that the compiler can optimize and can optimize with information that it knows about what the much later function that uses that information will actually do. So for example, if it knows that the backwards pass doesn't actually need some capture, it is allowed to do dead code elimination in the primal pass and just never compute it, right? And, and that's, the, that's the key difference that allows us to get performance is that it allows the compiler to basically know about the trace uh, trace and have some, you know, representation of what this trace is, even if there's like unknown dynamic, like strange code in the middle that it can't possibly see through to the point where that thing is actually called again. Uh, I have plenty more questions, but I'm keen to let other members of the audience ask questions. So um, type things in the chat or raise your hand, anybody? Uh, right. I see there's a question in the chat about other situations where standard closures can be, um, can be optimized this way? And the answer is yes. So if you only use the closure locally, so, uh, you know, again, I'm going back to this um, sort of locally, locally static neighborhood. So if you define a closure here, and then you call it here, within something that the Julia compiler can see is locally static, then it can do all the same optimization. Um, because then it can, it can know, you know, between here and here, there's never a dynamic redefinition of end dims um, that, uh, that needs to happen. And uh, uh, so it can, it can do the exact same optimization if it's, if it's locally static. But as soon as you need to cross a, a semantic boundary like here, so between these locally static regions, everything needs to have dynamic semantics. So there's some, some set of semantics that I call dynamic semantics that, you know, on the face of it are extremely slow, but 
you know, the point of Julia is just that these locally static regions are really large. So most of the time, you're not using dynamic semantics. And for the few things on the boundary that are, you are using dynamic semantics for, um, you know, it's actually kind of okay because the boundary tends to be fairly small or have not a lot of values going across it. Mm -hmm. So even if the dynamic semantics for something are expensive, um, it's only few values, so it, uh, it ends up not being uh, problematic. Um, which does actually bring me to another point, which is, okay, if that's the case, why not just use regular closures? And the answer is that for technical reasons, we're actually not allowed to define regular closures at the point of the compiler where we're doing this transformation. Uh, so that's really the secret motivation for opaque closures is that they're allowed to be created basically at any point in the compiler pipeline versus regular closures only allowed to be defined early. And the reason for that again has to do with world ages, uh, which is that opaque clo uh, regular closures introduce a world age, but um, uh, opaque closures don't. So they're allowed to be created in significantly more places uh, than regular closures because they don't participate in the world age mechanism. Uh, now, I, I know that's a handful and I know it's complicated, which is why I didn't talk about it. But that's sort of the secret motivation for why opaque closures are useful, um, even if everything is locally static, for technical reasons having to do with the way that they don't semantically absorb voltages. Anyone else want to ask a question? So if not, of course, I have more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, the next thing I'd like to ask about is compositionality. So yes. if a function f calls a function g and a function h, yeah. right? and um, then when you're taking the derivative of f, let's say, you know, one of these optical reverse mode WIMAMs, I don't quite know how you do it. Yeah. Then, um, you might like to have, could, could you, as it were, pre-compiled everything to do with g and h? So you don't inline them, you don't look at them. They're just sort of, you know, they're in a library, you're done with them. Yeah. So that your your AD transformation is strictly compositional. It only looks at the code for F when it's, of course, but it might do, compilers do a little bit of cross-module inlining perhaps to perhaps even quite a lot to improve performance, but it's not, they don't need to. You get the right answer and you get it yeah. asymptotically fast. So how does that work in this game? Um, if I look at the code for F after having differentiated, remember to source the source transform, I'm expecting yeah. to differ the derivative of F, I'm expecting to somehow call the derivative of G and the reverse derivative of F is somehow going to call the reverse derivative of G, except of course yeah. it has to call two functions. Right. Uh, so maybe this answers your question. So this is, this is the function F, uh, this is the function F, uh, that just calls, you know, f of x, and then it calls uh, uh, g of x, uh, and then it calls h of y, and then it returns uh, it returns z. So this is this is our original function. Okay. So if we if we apply the third order reverse mode functor to this function f this whole mess of things um, is what we, what the source to source transformation will actually uh, spit out. So, you know, it'll call, um, it'll call the uh, third order functor F, it'll call the, uh, it'll call the third order uh, functor of G, it'll call the third order functor of H, and then it'll capture, uh, it'll capture basically this pullback and then, you know, it, returns another closure and uh, in, in the actual implementation, all of these will be opaque closures. So this is, uh, this is from my write-up, so I omitted the opaque everywhere, but you know, think opaque closures in order to optimize this down. But so what it does is that it then calls this pullback that it computed up here, it calls it here, and then it calls the, the other one it calls here, and then you basically get, you know, you get more closures out and you just basically alternate this game all the way down, uh, uh, all the way down until, uh, until you reach the end where there's only one output. Um, so this would be, so this is third order, so it's not a three closure, it's a, 
like uh, it's not a three optic it's like an eight optic or something um, but that's basically what this uh, this composition looks like so th this is what the functor does to composition at third order it spits out it spits out this big function I see so y bar is the is the the closure that you can call later so it's not a, it's not a collection of things it's just a it's a function correct it's a function I see an opaque closure uh -huh. Uh -huh. right so like uh, if we called f right like what does f return it returns the original primal value z and then it returns some you know extremely big closure I see right so g could could look the same it would return some primal value and then some extremely big closure that we call that we call again the next time. Right. And I, I just want to point out that like, th that's why these locally static optimizations are important because we do want to collapse down all of this like big mess of closures into basically just like one closure. Yeah. Um, and that's what these locally static optimizations do. So that's, that's why opaque closures are kind of important is because they allow these optimizations and they allow the compiler to basically collapse all of this down into uh, then just the primitives. Right, cool, that makes sense. Um, uh, we have three minutes, so I've, uh, uh, any other questions? Um, no, so uh, uh, I, let, let me finish with one sort of elementary one. When you were, yeah. you said F has type X to Y, then you said F yeah. star has type tangent X to tangent Y. Yeah. And I was expecting to you to say F star as a type X to tangent X to tangent Y, because as you pointed out, the, you know, the, the F star function is a, well, it's kind of like a different function at every, at every point, isn't it? Yeah. So I was expecting it to have an X argument as well. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I was expecting uh, so X paired with TX arrow TY. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, so that's why I spend time on uh, terminology, but I, I was afraid that uh, it might get lost. So when I say TX here, I mean, uh, so TX is the tangent bundle of X, not the tangent space. Um, and what the, what the tangent bundle is, is so it's the, so TX, uh, is the disjoint union over X of the tangent space at X. Uh, uh, okay, nah. All right, let me, let me use different, let me use a different point. So it's the disjoint union over base points B of uh, the tangent. Uh, I need to be very careful with notation here. So this is T uppercase X. Uh, so the tangent bundle of some space X is the disjoint union over base points B at some base point uh, of my tangent space at B uh, to my space X. So we can identify this if, uh, uh, if your tangent space X is Euclidean, you can identify this with, you know, X times I'm going to call R. So like basically all these tangent spaces have the same structure in terms of uh, you know, the, the mathematical structure, but they are, they are distinct spaces. And in this cotangent basis problem that I mentioned, this becomes really important. But if, if, if things are simple, like in this case, you can basically say, okay, the tangent space is, is X uh, along with some number at each point. And if we go back to the diagram here, you know, we can say, okay, our tangent space, so what's an element of our tangent bundle? It's identifying some base point B and the length, uh, the length of our vector. So mm -hmm. some, some number that represents of the, the length of our vector. Um, so you're absolutely right that uh, we, ha we have to have both X and the tangent space at X. But the way that we write that is we define this um, this thing called the uh, the tangent bundle, which basically just abstracts over all the 
tangent spaces at all, at all the at all the different points. Because otherwise, you kind of need to write it as some sort of dependent type, where you know you have the type that x and then a pair of x and then the yeah the, you know you need to depend on the base point. So um, you know it means the same thing, but depending on you know what your language of types is, um, you know having having this dependent type uh, for the tangent space can be kind of complicated. Yeah. So the, the tangent bundle just basically abstracts over that. Okay. Very good question, though. Um, good. I think we're, uh, we're out of time now, so we should wrap up. Um, All right. So on behalf of everybody here, I'd like to uh, thank you, Kino, for a really interesting talk. And it's you know, impressive how much is, you know, is going on in Julia. It really is. Um, it's quite a big monster now. Yeah. <laughs> we've, we've done a lot of work on it. But, yeah. you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Very good. OK. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Bye, right, cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye.